Last week we talked about it, we sang a lot about it this morning in our worship, is God's radical love. Uh, and when we understand his love and what he's done in our lives, um, it, it, it has to overflow. When, when it takes root into our lives, it begins to transform us. And I think that's what part of the, just seeing the connection cards coming back and the work that God's doing in your lives. And I know that um, not everyone is going to return a, a card from week to week, but I know, I see it in your lives, that God is up to something um, in your heart. So this week we're talking, though, about, well, last week was a challenge of radical love. This week is a challenge um, of generosity. And in our lives, ultimately, when we get to the end of our days, it's going to be a life that's going to be um, characterized by generosity or by greed, and, and it's a choice that we get to make. How do we live our lives? Do we live our lives um, in a way that be, could be described as close-fisted or, or open-handed? We have a close-fisted living or open-handed living. On, on your outline at the very top is our memory verse this week. And I'm so grateful. I told you guys um, two weeks ago, I think it was, um, that there's a memory verse every week, and I'm memorizing these verses, and you can challenge me. And if I can't say the verse on Sunday, uh, the following week, and I've been saying that's what I'm saying that because people have been challenging me this week during the week, and I'm like, I've got till Sunday to memorize the verse. So um, you can't ask me now, not in the middle of the sermon, but after the service. And if I can't say the memory verses from this week and last week, um, then I owe a dollar um, to, to missions, to, um, and we haven't established where that will go. We need to come up with where that's going to go. Um, and so all of you can nail me if I can't get it. So I've been working really hard because people have been asking me this week. But our memory verse this week was going to be our, what we'll start with. Um, and you know, like if you've got a, uh, this is just a copy of the New Testament in Psalms. You see that our New Testament challenges, it's not that much. It is, it is a challenge to read 15 to 20 minutes a day um, and to carve out that time. But man, God, I know God is working in you because I know he's working in me. And if you're opening up and if you're getting behind, don't feel that pressure of like, oh my gosh, you know, I just need to give up and quit. I'm such a loser, you know, because that's the way we feel sometimes, right? No, just pick up where you left off and just keep on keeping on. If you hadn't started, on our website, you can go to friendshiprva.org, and there's a little tab at the top that says New Testament Challenge. You can see the, um, the, there's a syllabus of the daily readings, and just pick up where we are, or start from the beginning, wherever. The point is, is that we're getting in God's Word, and it's so transformation, transformational for our lives. But today's memory verse, if you have one of these um, at home, like some of you, um, they, they have red letter Bibles. You know what? Who, why are the, what, what's the red letters all about, you know? Anyone? All right, so somewhere along the line that somebody decided, hey, when, when we print our Bibles, any time that Jesus is actually speaking, we're going to use the red letters. So where are all the red letters found? The Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's a story of Jesus' life, um, and that's where he's, his, his story is told. It's where he speaks, and you, and you see those red letters. But there's a couple other places in the Bible uh, where you see those red letters, and one of them is here in Acts 20, verse 35, and you would have read that this past week in your New Testament challenge. Jesus, uh, the words are said, you should remember the words of the Lord Jesus, quote, red letters, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Now, how many of you would say, it's like, like that, it is more blessed to give than to receive, or would you say it is more blessed to give than to receive? How many would say blessed? How many would say blessed? It just depends on where you're from. You know, if you're from the South, like we are, you know, probably more blessed to give than receive. Um, <laughs> But uh, Jesus, Jesus holds up this, this um, challenge, and, he, and this, not, this teaching is not in the Gospels, uh, but Paul refers to it. He says, you should remember the words of the Lord Jesus. It is more blessed to give um, than to receive. Uh, are we going to be generous? Are we going to be giving in our lives? Are we going to live with an open hand? Or are we going to live um, with a closed fist? That's your choice. The closed-fisted living is like, you know what? This, whatever God puts into our hands, we just close it up and we say, this is mine. It's mine. You know, I, I think about like Gollum. For, is that his name from uh, The Lord of the Rings? You know, my precious, you know. This is mine. You can't have it. But an open-handed life says, God, you know, what, what is mine is thine. What you've given this, I'm just a steward. This is yours, God. Everything that I have, all that you've given me is, is yours. So we get, we get to choose. Greed is a life-draining option. If we choose greed and close-fisted living, Ultimately, it's not a win-win, it's a win-lose. It's going to destroy us from the inside out, but generosity is an opportunity for us to grow and to share. It's a win-win. We're blessed. Jesus said it is more blessed um, to give uh, than to receive. And here's the deal. Just like last week with the challenge of radical love, if we begin to love like Jesus, um, and I hope if you, did, if you missed that message, it should be up on our website. You can see the options there um, to see it. Um, but radical um, generosity can change the world. It really can, and the reason I know that's true is because it happened already once, like 2,000 years ago when Jesus was around. It started with him, 
And then he challenged his disciples with radical love. He challenged them to a life of radical generosity. And they began to share what he did in their lives. And it began, it started with the 12, and then it went to 120, and then it went to 3,000, and then it went to hundreds of thousands to millions and even billions of people. Um, and it started with just a handful. And here, right here at Friendship, you know, like we're, we're in that, you know, probably that area between 120 and 150 regular attenders, maybe more. But if Jesus could do it with 11 or 12 guys, he can certainly do it through us. And as you become pockets of light in your community, you go, you know what, it does matter what I do for God. And that as I begin to honor him, um, you, he, he will change our world. He will change your home. He will change your community. But it begins with us. And the reason is Jesus, generosity is contagious. When we become generous with our lives, we start modeling and setting an example for others. It begins to change other people. So the, today's outline is really simple. You'll probably be able to figure out um, all the fill-ins before I even get there. But the first one today, just about four big areas, because the New Testament, it talks a lot about, our, um, about generosity. And I'm going to try to condense it all down into four main um, areas. And the first one is that generous uh, living means to be generous uh, with my time. So we want to be generous with our time. Every one of us woke up today and we've got 24 hours that God has given us in every, every, every day we, we have. That's 1,440 minutes. That's 86,400 seconds. All of us have 24 hours in which to live. But the truth of the matter is, we've been given today, but we really don't, we're not guaranteed tomorrow. We're not even guaranteed this afternoon. I, I do get um, your connection cards, but I get prayer. You know, maybe you guys are on the God's People Praying email list that we have, and people are sharing prayer requests, and I hear these requests. And man, people get hit with big stuff all the time. And you're just going along, living life, and you think everything's all right. And then you just wake up one day, and all of a sudden, you know, boom, there's a car accident. And boom, there's a cancer diagnosis. And life can change and turn on a dime. There were, every one of us is given a certain amount of time, but we don't know when that time is going to end. I love, I love to save time, and um, Courtney and I are huge fans of a particular apparatus, and that is the DVR. I don't know how many of you guys are addicted to the DVR. It costs money to have a DVR, and thank God that, you know, we can afford it, and it's not that much. But when you think about it, um, getting a DVR when it comes to our time, because with a DVR, you can record episodes. Just like yesterday, we watched basketball, and we're Carolina fans, and thank God they, they beat Pittsburgh, and then they beat Duke, and then they beat Carolina. Of course, they didn't beat any Virginia teams yet, so more power to y'all. Yet, yeah, I haven't beat any of y'all yet. It's coming. Um, but, but we watched the North Carolina UNC versus NC State game, uh, but we started it late and somewhat intentionally because we just hate the time that it takes to watch commercials. And, and it's so worth the time and, and the cost to have a DVR because if, you, like, if you're watching a sitcom, it's 30 minutes long. If you record it and watch it later, you can watch it in 20 minutes, and then you just saved yourself some time. Um, for some of us, you know, we just take that time and we watch another sitcom and we wasted more time. Um, but you can take that time that God has given you and, and you can ask a question, a great prayer to pray, and you can write this on your outline somewhere is, God, what is the best use of my time? God, what is the best use of the time? You've given me a resource. It's called time. It, time is one of our most precious commodities, probably more important than anything else that we have. What is the best use of my time? When you come home at night from being away from your family all day, you know, maybe you, you work eight to five or whatever it is, and you come in, you can say, what is the best use of my time? You know, some of us, you know, we get our cell phones, and, you know, and, and this is a huge temptation of mine. You know, you get, get these games on here, you like Candy Crush. I'm at like, you know, level in like 795 or something now. I don't know where you guys are. Um, but, you know, is that the best use of my time? Or maybe we need to get a basket and just put it at the front of our house and just say, as I go in the door, I'm just going to drop it in there and just let that be for the time being. What is the best use of my time? I, I don't, I'm not as faithful with this. It's a little different because Courtney's working from home now. Um, but I don't know who I heard this from, but somebody gave me some marriage advice once, and it was like, uh, if you work outside of the house and, um, and you're coming home and, and your spouse has been there, it doesn't matter which one of you it is, uh, and you haven't been together, and the challenge was to take the first 15 minutes of being at home and just be within five feet of your spouse. No matter what's happening, you know, and it's really, it gets really weird. They'll start thinking, like, man, it's really odd. Like, she's walking up, you know, like, oh, she, Courtney's over here. So, you know, and so she, and just, and just, just stand there and hang out, you know, and just spend time being close to your spouse and just go, you know, and just, because and, they're going to move around, you know, dinner's getting ready, but just move with them. And it'll really, it'll freak them out. But it's a great use of your time. Just, just take that little tip and just spend that time and just, and just know, and now that you're hearing it here, and when your husband or wife does that to you later today or tomorrow, you're like, man, you're being weird, but you know, hey, 
let's be weird intentionally. Um, let's invest in one another. Let's spend time um, together. And, and another way, another best use of your time, some of you, you know, you've committed yourself and said, I want to take the New Testament challenge. And, and you started reading God's Word and allowing it to just penetrate your heart. And it is truly food for the soul. Uh, and some of you, what, you know, you get up in the morning, what's the best use of some of my time in the morning? Um, hey, it's to open up God's Word and to spend some time in it. Some of you are early morning people. You, you get up early like me, and that's your best time. Others of you, it's at nighttime. I could never do it. Courtney reads at night, and, and she's every night. She's in the bed, you know, and I'm like, you're going to read the New Testament challenge? You know, I'm trying to sleep here, you know, but, um, you know, I can sleep through anything. Um, uh, hurricanes, lights, it doesn't matter. So it's a good thing. But I get up in the morning, I do it. That's the best, I think that's the best use of my time. And I know that God is working as, you're, as, you, as you are opening your um, lives to God's word and taking that time. He, he, is, he is challenging you. Um, it was on your outline there, you see, um, of course, I skipped a blank. The highest level of living is, is generous living. If you want, I, I'm sure the, the, the things will come up here as they go and, and help you when I do stuff, do stuff wrong. Um, but the first illustration here is the Good Samaritan in Luke 10. And you haven't read that in your challenge. It's going to come up here in a few weeks as you read through the Gospels, uh, the first part of the challenge. But you know the story. How many of you guys have heard of the Good Samaritan, right? Like everybody, like almost everybody in culture, even outside of church, knows the concept of the Good Samaritan. Jesus told the story, you know, 2,000 years ago. We even have laws, you know, like Good Samaritan laws, you know, and stuff like that. I mean, it's even, you know, it's that in, in, infiltrated into our culture. But you know the story largely is that there was this, the story that Jesus tells this guy was walking along this, this dangerous road, and he got beat up and robbed and left for dead. And then there was this priest, this, this Jewish religious leader who came by and he saw him and he walked on the other side of the road. Because, and we, we've talked about this in another message. Um, but he had his reasons, but he said, the best use of my time is not to help that person. And then another um, religious leader, a Levite, comes by and he sees him and he does the same thing and he walks on the other side. But then finally, the good Samaritan comes by. And he has every reason, because presumably Jesus is telling the story, the guy in the story that's been beaten up is Jewish and uh, the Jews and the Samaritans didn't get along. They didn't like each other. They um, and so he had every reason to walk on the other side of the road, but he set an example for us, and that's why we know the story of the Good Samaritan. He says, the best use of my time is to spend some of it serving somebody in need, that I will sacrifice some of my time, some of my energy, some of the, the, some of the most important commodity that I have, and it was not only the time, but some other things that he shared, um, but he did that and, and set that example for us. And Jesus tells a story, and he gets to the end, and he asks whoever he's telling the story to, he says, which of these two should you be like? And the answer was, well, obviously, it, it, we're supposed to be like the, um, the Good Samaritan. And, and Jesus says, yes, go and do likewise. Spend your time serving others. And Jesus has given us that time. And, and what sets him apart, what sets the Samaritan apart, and what's going to set our lives apart is, you know, God, what is the best use of my time? How can I use it um, in serving you? When, uh, the, one of, another example here, uh, within the life of our church, it, it's, every, it's, it's, so, it's so amazing. It's so wonderful. Um, it's not just Sundays, because what happens on Sunday, you know, there were people here, and I'll talk about the band in a little bit too, uh, but there were other people here this morning early. They get here every morning, probably some of them before you even get out of bed, before your eyes even crack open, and they're doing things to prepare this place um, to serve you. They're giving other time. I can't tell you how many people, I've joked some lately, they've been serving so much at the church during the week, and admittedly, in, in some of these cases, people are retired, but they're saying, how can I use my time? I'm like, we should be putting you on the payroll. I mean, you're here so much. Um, you should be getting paid for this. You are putting in so much time. And, and God wants, and God is calling, and he desires for all of us to serve him. Check out the verse on your outline, 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Um, I love this verse. It says, therefore, my dear brothers, stand firm, let nothing move you, always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, that's your time, uh, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Another, another version of that verse says, um, your labor in the Lord is never wasted. And I just want to encourage some of you, because you're serving, and you're serving, and you're investing, and sometimes you might get discouraged and go, what, is it worth it? And I want to tell you, yes, it is. You are making an eternal difference in people's lives by your consistent investment in their lives. We don't always bear a ton of fruit all the time, but it's over time that God is going to work, and he is working in your lives. I see it. I want to encourage you, if you don't have a place of service uh, within the body of Christ, um, that God, God, God desires for you to do that. And like we, we've, we've said this, we've had this little concept of worship one service, serve another. Like, you're worshiping right now, and then you get a chance to go to Sunday school, and then we have a second service. You know, there are needs and opportunities that you can serve to help um, serve the, um, the, the traditional service that meets at 11. And the same thing is, is true of them, that, that they come in and they can come here early, 
while um, they wouldn't have anything else otherwise to do, just hang out at home and, and whatever, but they can serve while we're worshiping so that then when they worship, we can serve them, that we do that together. So the first thing that we can do, the first area of generosity is our time. The second is I can be generous um, with my talents. Time and talents. You can see it's going to be T alliteration if you want to try to fill in the blanks before I get there. Your time and your talents. Um, I don't know how many of you are old enough to remember. I remember as a kid, um, there was a show about the bionic man. Anybody remember the bionic man? I had a little figure, you know, and he had a bionic eye and an arm and all this, and you could, you know, Six million dollar man, yeah, that's him. Um, what was his name? You remember? Steve Lee Majors was the actor. Steve Austin, what? I don't know. <laughs> Not the wrestler, uh, but but the beyond, there was the Bionic Man and there was the Bionic Woman. Anybody remember the TV show, The Bionic Woman? I mean, it was it was a little less, you know, um, didn't get us quite the notoriety. They, they've redone it, um, but the storylines for both of them were about the same. And talking about talents, you know, basically you got these people who were injured, and then somebody took it and remade them. And with the bionic woman, it was like they put like five million dollars of like bionics and rebuilt this woman's life. And one of the things about that story is it's like the second episode of that particular show. Like there, there was a sense that the lady rejected it. She was like the character said, "You know what? I, I don't know why they put all this stuff into me. I'm not going to use it. I'm not going to use this, this talent that got, that these people have put into me." And, and, and the inventor and the, and the doctors and all, they came in and they say, look, we have invested in you $5 million. We have equipped you with all of this so that you can do good and you can serve the world and you could change the world. And it's such a great illustration of what's in us. Is a guy could say to you, you know what, I've invested, you know, literally he could say, I've given up my life for you. And then I've put so much into you. And yet sometimes our gifts are just sitting up on the shelf. That God has given us so many talents, so many abilities. I mean, our talents, there's so many different type of talents. It's not just, you know, like the musical ones or the speaking ones or the teaching ones. Or the talents come in all form, shapes and sizes. You know, like literally one of the talents you have is your personality. Some of you are super outgoing, you know, and, and you can just, you know, welcome people. So you'd make a great greeter. Others of you are super really introverted, but you can spend some time really investing and being present uh, with people. But you've got talents, and are you using those to invest um, as God has invested in you, are you taking those gifts off of the shelf? I'm so appreciative um, of, of this morning and, and how it represents, you know, like these guys and gals that have been up here serving this morning, you know, they've had, um, you know, Jay sitting over there. You might know what that, that box he's sitting on, you know, it's called a cajon, you know, it's weird, you know, but yeah, I, didn't, I didn't know a box could make that kind of noise, but Jay does a good job at it, but he's got that talent um, and, and God has given him that and he's developed it and he can use it. God has given you a talent, but maybe it's singing, maybe it's musical, maybe it's athletics, maybe it's, you know, it, it's something, you know, you're analytical and, and you're good with numbers or something like that. Don't leave your gifts up on the shelf, that God wants to use your, your time, he wants to use your talents, and he wants you to be open fist or not open, not close-fisted, but open-handed um, in your service um, to him in, in the world. Look at, I love this verse, Ephesians 2, um, 10. It says, for we are God's workmanship. God has worked. He's, he's invested in you. You're like the bionic man or woman, you know. He, he, you, for we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. God saved us. He, he, Christ died for us and he redeemed us, not so that we just could live willy-nilly and do whatever. I mean, it's fine. We get to choose what we want to do with our lives, whether it's closed-fisted or open-handed, greedy or generous. But God's saying, I've got works. I've got things I want you to do. I've got plans for you. And, and will we get on board and, and, and jump over that hurdle and, and become a part of that? He's gifted every one of us. There's another verse there on your outline, 1 Corinthians 12, 7. It says, now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. What that means is, is that when you become a believer, God puts his Spirit into your life, and he gives you a spiritual gift. He's given you those talents. He's given you those abilities. And, and who does it say it's for? It's for the common good. It's not just for me. Now, I can use my time and my talents, and, and I'll give away the next one, my treasure, to serve myself. I mean, I, I can do that. I can make a living. I can, you know, I can use what God has, has given me to go out and, and, and earn a living and have a job. But it shouldn't just stop there. It's that I need to take what he's given me and put it into practice in the service of the common good of the church, that he's equipped me to serve you, and he's equipped you to serve the rest of us. I love, you've heard this quote perhaps, it says, you can make a living by what you get, but you make a life um, by what you give. 
You make a living by what you get, but you make a life by what you give. And so many of you are giving, and I see it, and I'm so grateful. Uh, and so many of you have so much to give. And here, here's why it's so important that you, you don't live um, like with that close fist when it comes to your time, your time and your talents. It's because you can't, it's impossible to become like Jesus without serving. Jesus said, I did not come to serve, to be served, but to serve. It's impossible to become like him unless we're using those gifts. It's so imperative that we put them um, into practice. So we got our time, we got our talents, and I told you the third one is your treasure, you know, because you have to have um, alliteration. Time, talents, and treasure. That's, that's your, your, literally your money. That's the financial resources that God um, has poured um, into your life. Last week we talked about um, in, in living in, in the challenge of God's radical love, one of them was that we forgive freely. And we made the point, if we're not forgiving others for when they hurt us, we're stunting our spiritual growth. We're like building a wall. Every time we don't forgive, we're just putting a brick in, and we're putting a wall between ourselves and others, but we're also putting a wall between ourselves and God. And we cannot grow, and we will not grow. You will not develop until you become as forgiving to others as God has been forgiving to you. You are literally stunting your spiritual growth. And I think the same is true here. We can be generous with our time. We can be generous with our talents. But if we're living a closed-fisted life that says, God, you know, what's, what I have, what I'm earning, you know, even though you gave me the ability to get up this morning and breathe and to have health and to earn a living, it's mine, it's mine, it's mine. We are going to stunt our spiritual growth um, in the same way. And Jesus, Jesus taught more about money because our hearts are so tied to our wallets often. It's a good representation um, and, and what did Jesus teach us about money? I'm going to try to sum it up in three words here in just a minute. You can write these on the, on the side of your outline. Um, but I love what he says in Matthew 23, 23. It's on your outline. He's talking to the Pharisees, and they were talking about all um, the money that they were, and things that they were committing to God. And he says to them, yes, you should tithe. And the key word there, you might want to underline is the word tithe. We're going to talk about that in a minute. But, and you shouldn't leave the more important things undone either is that some people think the Old Testament, you know, we, we've heard the word tithe, and we say, oh, that's the Old Testament. The Old Testament, they taught tithe. What does tithe mean? Anybody? 10%. Literally means 10% of something. And they had an offering. If you want to get specific about it, in the Old Testament, they were actually tithing 22.5% of their income. You can come talk to me about that later. I won't go into that now. Um, but the tithe literally means um, 10%. And I've heard people say, you know, well, I tithe 5%. No, you don't. You can't tithe 5%, tithe, percent. Ten, tithe is 10%. You can't tithe 22 and a half either, like I said just a minute ago. They were giving above and beyond. We're going to talk about that. But a tithe is 10%. It's so interesting that Jesus tells the Pharisees, he doesn't do away with the Old Testament standard of, of hey, 10% of my income, I return back to God to show him, God, you're in control of this. I'm a steward of all of this. I'm going to trust you with what you've given me. He says, yes, you should tithe. But don't neglect the other things either, like forgiveness and love and mercy and those kind of things. But he doesn't do away with tithing. So God wants us to bring um, the tithe to God. Jesus said it is more blessed to give than to receive. Um, and so here's the, to summarize the New Testament teaching on this idea of treasure in three words. The first word is the word consistent. When it comes to your giving, when it comes to honoring God with your, with your treasure, the first one is to give consistently, is that you, you know, come back to God and we give you opportunities to give each week. And you support the work of the church. And we have a faithful church in giving. And we're not asking for more, but I'm just telling you, like our spiritual growth, if we're not trusting God and honoring God with our income, we're going to be stunted individually and as a church. The second area, the second way to give proportionally, and that's, that's, the word, that's where we get in the 10%, that you give a proportion, that you, you don't just go, well, what do I have to give? You know, God, here's what you get. God, you've, you've called me, you've blessed me, here's what I'm going to give back to you. I'm going to start with 10%. I'm just going to write that off the top. I'm not going to wait and give you the leftovers of what I have, but I'm going to give proportionally to you. So I'm going to be consistent. I'm going to give proportional, easy to say, proportionately, and also finally sacrificially. Is that we give um, consistently, we give proportionally, but we can also give sacrificially. Every now and then, in our every different seasons of the church's life, we have special offerings. At Christmas, we do what we call the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. Lottie Moon was a missionary, and, and it goes to support foreign uh, mission work international mission work. And we say, hey, be prepared for that. You know, let's give because we, our, our, um, our denomination, the Southern Baptist Convention, is the biggest missionary organization in the world. We send more missionaries and tell more people about Jesus than anybody else in the world. And they can't do that unless all of us Southern Baptist churches give back to them um, through the Lottie Moon offering and some of our regular offerings as well. And that's how we help to spread the gospel. Same thing is true at Easter. We give, we've got Easter coming up on um, April 1st this year. 
Um, we give the Annie Armstrong Easter offering, and that money goes to help plant churches largely. Um, it, it goes to help plant churches here in North America. That our culture is, is now post-Christian, and there's a need for more and more churches and more and more communication of the gospel um, in, the, in the United States as much as there is in the world. And so we take up these special offerings. And I just wanted to give you a heads up that in a couple of weeks from now, um, two or three weeks, I can't remember exactly what Sunday, we're going to have um, a, an organization come in here and share a little bit with you. And you've probably heard of them. If you've never heard of them, you've, you've seen them. They've impacted your life, and it's the Gideons. Where, do you, where, where have most of you heard of the Gideons? Hotel Bibles. That's one, of the, that's one of the most minor things that they do. One of their goals, is that the whole purpose of the Gideons is to get God's Word um, into people's lives so they have an opportunity to read it. You know what? This is a Gideon Bible. I got this from a Gideon somewhere at some time. Um, but they put them in our hotel, so, and, and, they, they, and the guy's going to come and just share with you some stories about how God has used it. But they try to get into college campuses, high school campuses, elementary. You might see them up at the fair, I've heard here, at, in, uh, the, the, I don't know if it's the state fair or the county fair. Whatever. They get out there, and they're distributing God's Word. And I just want to prepare you that we're going to take them an offering for the Gideons because they can't distribute God's Word if it's not paid for. And so um, they're very, very um, good with their money, and they're accountable with, with what they do. But in just a few weeks, we're going to have them come in, and we're going to take up a special offering um, to support the, um, the work of, that they do in their ministry as well. So we're generous with our time, we're generous with our talents, and we're generous with our treasure. And, and, and one of the things about that is when we give, it, it, we're giving to something that's eternal. When we're giving back to God, when we're giving back to the church, when we're giving the missions, it's going to outlast us. Look at the verse on your outline, Matthew 6. 19 through 21, Jesus says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I love last week uh, we talked about in our, I think it was on Sunday night in our New Testament Challenge Bible study, we were talking about the heart. And, and so much of what you've been reading in Matthew, I don't know if you've noticed that theme over and over again. It's about, you know, the, um, it's about, it's not just the outward manifestation. It's not just, oh, have I been doing right things? But have I been doing them for the right reasons? Where's my heart? What's going on in my heart? God wants your heart. He doesn't want your wallet. He doesn't want just your time. He doesn't want you just to use it. He doesn't want you to go through the motions. He wants to penetrate through to our heart. Yeah, our first memory verse for God's word is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to the body, soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It, um, it judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. God wants to get through and into our hearts. The final um, out, uh, T there on your outline is being generous with my testimony. Your testimony is your story. That each of us has a story to tell. On Wednesday nights, we've been having a, a, what we're calling worship in the word. Uh, in the last three weeks, um, I've been doing it on the theme of why do we believe in Jonah and the whale? You know, like you go, you know, like you go out and somebody finds out you're a Christian, you're like, well, do you really believe that stuff about like Jonah and the whale? I mean, come on, a man got swallowed by a great fish or a whale and, you got, and then got spit back out. You know, come on. You don't really believe that, do you? Well, I do. I really do. I do believe that. And I have good reason to believe that. And if you had been here the last three weeks, you'd know why. But you, yeah. but you missed it. So... Come this week, I don't even know what I'm doing this week. Last week I asked for questions, and so, uh, but we're going to be talking about stuff like that. Like this is, this is um, um, hitting on some of these, these issues that can help you go out into our culture and say this is why we believe um, what we believe. But each of us has a, um, a story to tell, and it's a part of that Wednesday worship and the Word. We've had different people tell their stories. Um, last week, you really missed it, Hannah, um, shared, Hannah Martin shared her story and sang us a song um, about her story. And this week, we'll have somebody else telling their story, that God has done something in your life. And I love your stories. You know, some of you think, oh, my story's so boring. No, it's not. Your story is really, really interesting. What, where your story intersects with God's story is, is an amazing thing. And God wants to use you, and he wants you to be generous with that story. Because if you've intersected with him and God has changed your life through Christ, he can use your story to help someone else get closer. Uh, if you, as you've been reading through Acts in the New Testament challenge, you saw Paul tell his story. He went before King Agrippa, um, and he began to tell his story about how God had changed his life, about how he met God, Christ, on the road to Damascus, and all these different things that happened. And he just shared um, his story. And there's a verse on your outline from Acts 26, um, 16, um, Paul rec recalls what happened to him and what Jesus said to him. And Jesus said to him, I've appeared to you to appoint you as my servant and my witness. You are to tell the world about this experience. 
God wants us to share our experience of what happened in our lives with others. And all of us are going to do that in unique and different ways. You don't have to go door to door, you know, and just saying, hey, have you heard about Jesus? Hey, have you heard about Jesus? Hey, you You know, somebody might be called to do that. That's fine. How is God calling you to be generous with your testimony? But what is your story? Some of us don't share it because we're not truly familiar and, and, and haven't really thought it through. And so there is on your outline there kind of some homework for you to do. Um, and, and it's on the back of your outline. If I can find mine, I'll, I'll read it off to you. But it's, it's to write your testimony, just to spend some time thinking about, you know, what, what is my story? And, and it's basically three parts, my life before I became a Christian. For some of you, you know, you were real like Hellraiser type people, you know, you were out there. I mean, you were way out there, and, and people would look at you and say, you know what, there's no way that person is going to come to know Jesus. But you did, and God got through to you, and he changed your life. So that's your story before you became a Christian, and then there's the part about, well, how did I become a Christian? How did I reach that, that bottom, that, that, that when I hit rock bottom and had nowhere else to look? Who did God use to bring me to Christ? Was it, you know, hey, I was in church all the time, or hey, it was somebody at my work that shared with me. It was a neighbor, it was a friend, it was a grandparent. God used all these different people, and then eventually I met this person, Jesus, and I understood that I needed a Savior and that there was forgiveness, and I asked him into my life. And you tell him how you became a Christian, and then you, then, then you just tell him, hey, here's what he's doing now. Look at what he's doing in my life. This is, this is my life after Christ. I don't do those other things that I used to do, and now he's replaced them with something that's so much better and so much greater, and, and he's saved, you know, my family. He's saved my marriage. He's saved my life. He, he's given me new uh, hope and purpose and meaning. So I want to challenge you to sit down and think about what is your story, and I would love to hear your story. We can't have a story on Wednesday night if some of y'all don't volunteer to share your story. And I, would I want to hear your stories. I love the stories. We, had one, we did this on our Sunday night one time, and one, one of our ladies in the, in the, in, from our 11 o'clock service, she shared her story, and she just sat there, and she told it. She got to the end, and she's like, oh, I know that was boring. And I, I sat there the entire time, like my mouth like dropped, like, and she thought, your story's boring. Are you kidding me? It's amazing what God is doing in your life and what he's done. And, and it's, I think it's true for all of us, whether you've had this wild and crazy story or it's just a real simple story, it's a story of God. I want to close with this. There's a, the last verse on your outline there. Such a powerful verse to me. And what, what brings us all together, it says, I pray, it's a great prayer, that you may be active in sharing your faith so that you will have a full understanding of every good thing we have in Christ. I think we can, we can translate this a little, little broader. And it's not just sharing your faith. I pray that you may be active in sharing your faith. That's your time, your talents, your treasure, and your testimony. God has placed all that in you. That's a part of your faith. And as you're sharing that with other people, the end result is, and it's kind of like hedonistic, you'll actually grow in your own faith. The way you grow is by sharing. The way you grow is by being generous with what God has put in your life. And when you do that, it says you will have a full understanding of every good thing you have in Christ. The reason some of you aren't growing, the reason you, don't, you have so many questions and you're so stuck spiritually and you're like, God, why aren't you showing up? It's because you've been living a little like this. And God says, I want you to open up a little bit. Would you open up and just open your life and share? God has placed time in your life 24 hours every day. He's given you talents and abilities. He's given you um, a certain amount of treasure to use to serve him. And we all have a testimony where our lives is intersected with God's. And he wants to use that for his glory.